Okay, can everyone hear me clearly? If you can, please go ahead and put your greeting in the chat box. My name is Pranithia and I am your host for today. Yes, if you can hear me, let me know. Put a hi, put a smiley face, something like that. Let me know you can hear me. All right, I think Natalie says we can hear you. Hello, everyone. And if someone doesn't mind unmuting themselves briefly, just so I can know that I can hear somebody as well. I can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> All right, I see a lot of hellos, so that's a good sign. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I apologize for the delay. I had a few of my other, I had some other guests trying to get into the room. We're having some technical difficulties that always seems to happen with technology, but I am so glad. Is my picture clear? Can you see me clearly and all of that? I'm trying to figure out which screen. Your yeah, screen share looks Zoom. clear to me. And this is my first one of the year. So I'm super excited. Awesome. Thank you for the response. So we have Cheryl in the room. Hi, Cheryl, Sarah, Brittany, Lisa. If I don't get to you all, I apologize. Natalie, uh, Tika or Tika, Tika. Yeah. Uh, Larissa. All right. I'm so happy. A lot of you guys have been in the chat. Hey, Miss Lucy. I miss you. I have to call you up sometime. Uh, hi, Patty. All right, everything looks great. Well, since we're starting late, that means we're going to go over time, which I don't like to do, but we will. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Let's see. Can you guys see the welcome screen on the side? Let me know if you can see that using the chat. Yes, it's, it's on really the main page. Screen. We can see it. And it gives you a couple of instructions on what to do. And then you probably won't, you'll see me, but I won't see you in a few moments. But my name is Pranithia. I'm going to introduce myself briefly. Um, the welcome screen does say to please make sure that you are, that your phone's muted, um, that you have everything that you need for today. I suggest a pencil, a pen, all of those wonderful things to help you as we go through this event. All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So let's see, I'm going to make this bigger and we are going to begin. All right, so grab some pencils, some paper, highlighters even, mute your mic, place your phones on vibrate, silence, uh, grab your favorite beverage. Right now I have water nearby. I didn't take a sip before this, trying to make sure everyone was uh, ready to rock and roll. And just tell us hi, where you're from and your level of experience with gardening on a scale of one to 10. That would be awesome. So I'm gonna give everyone a few minutes to say hello and tell us where they're from and their experience. And then we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna close my camera for a second while you guys do that. All righty, guys, I'm so glad you all were able to share. We're going to go ahead and begin. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and start my video because I think you guys will be able to see me and see the presentation. Let me know if you can see it. I'm sharing my screen. 
All right. Hi, Allison. Hi, Kim. If you can see the welcome video, let me know. You can um, take off your video, open it up, do a thumbs up. You can put a check mark, smiley face in the chat box. Let me know if you can see the welcome screen. And then I can see we both. will begin. All right. I'm loving it. I'm just reading the chat box, guys, getting to know everyone. All right. All right. Well, I hope you guys can see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Let's see. I'm trying to make sure my video is accessible. Hi, Felton. Thank you for calling in. I'm excited. All righty, guys. Let's go. All right. So my name is Pranithia Harmon. I am and have been gardening ever since I was a young child. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. And if not, jumping into gardening can be overwhelming, but it does not have to be. And I'm here today to give you those tips and tricks to help you move forward in your adventures with gardening. This is an experience in itself, and it involves a lot of experiments. So get ready to just enjoy yourselves. And like I said, make sure you have that pen and pencil handy so that you guys can be involved and have all the information you need to have a successful gardening experience. All right. So I've been doing this for, I lived in an apartment for about five years and I did an actual balcony and patio um, apartment garden. So it came out very, very beautifully. I was super excited about it. And my daughter at the time she was two, she was like my helper in the garden. She helped water, she helped grow things with me, plant them. So it was nice. And now I live in my a home. I've been here for about four years and that helped me expand my garden. So I have a lot of experience growing in different types of gar gardens and that kind of, I just wanted to share what I have learned with you guys. So we're going to go pretty fast. I want to make sure that I stick to the close time frame of one hour. I hope you guys can appreciate that. I'm sure you can, especially if you have little ones or dinners at seven or something along those lines. Um, so we're going to try to stick it out. Um, so here are the topics for today. The first one is choosing your location. What container should I grow in? Sketch it out. So this is our opportunity to use that paper and pen and draw our layouts. Uh, should I plant seeds or purchase seedlings? Soil selection and maintenance and garden protection tips. And then last but not least, the question and answer session, because I know I had a lot of questions that came about in the chat and I just wanted to make sure I touch on quite a few of them. Um, all right, so here is one of my favorite quotes. If you are following me on Instagram, which I suggest that you do, um, and you'll get links for all that at the very, very end. It says there are no gardening mistakes, only experiments, which I mentioned when we started. Um, in the garden, you're going to sometimes plant a seed and it won't germinate, it won't grow. You'll sometimes, you'll sometimes plant, let's see, you might plant a tomato that you bought from Lowe's or Home Depot, put it in the ground and you get one tomato, disaster. But the goal is to keep trying. Everything that you put in your garden, you can now and are now able to move forward knowing that in gardening, there are going to be plenty of things that occur, but everything there is an experiment for me to learn from. So just take note of that. It's all an experience. All right, so first things first, choosing your location. We're going to begin. Let's see, I want to see some people. I'm gonna go ahead and put my window back up. Ah, Nikki, thanks for sharing your video. I appreciate seeing your face. All right, we're gonna go ahead and choose our location. So this is one of the most important parts. And this is where I see people make the biggest a mistake when they're first starting their garden. They tend to plant it in several areas and a lot of those areas may not be the best for your plants. Um, as we go into it farther, we'll see that on the backs of our seed packages in catalogs that we look at on the various seed starting or seed purchasing websites, you'll see all this information about certain crops and things that you wanna choose. But they'll also give you that information that says, 
full sun or less sun or part shade. You'll see those things on the back of your seed package. And that is important. When you're in a, when you choose your location, you wanna pay attention to the sun, the shade, how your, your grounds are after it rains and wind. For sun, the plants that need that full sun may need to be positioned where you get full sun in your yard. Same for shady or part shade plants. They need to be in a certain place. After the rain, it can be slushy, muddy, and you wanna pay attention to that when you're building your raised beds. Wind, here in zone eight where I live in the state of Louisiana, we get hurricanes. Um, the winds are very, very powerful sometimes. So my garden is actually in an L-shaped corner of my home. So it gets protected from the wind from two sides. And then I have lots of trees. I have a shed, everything back there. So my garden is fairly protected from the wind. So paying attention to these things when choosing your location is super, super important. Next is access to water. The most frequent space that you would use once you put your garden together you're going to visit that garden. You want to be able to walk out to that space easily and also water easily. This means you would be more likely to water your garden. So choose a, a place where water is to start your garden. Next is choosing between your backyard, patio, balcony. If you live in an apartment, townhome, you might have more of a patio, balcony. Uh, some townhomes do come with the backyard. If you're living in a home, um, you have a backyard accessible, you can put your garden there. You have to choose and make a decision on where you want it to go. Fenced in, no fence. I remember someone had a question about that because it had some deer and visitors in their backyard. I can totally understand that. Uh, that choice would, of course, be up to you if you do have animals and things in your backyard. If you Google a few pictures, you'll see some nice size fencing that you would just build around your garden space. So it takes a little more work, but it pays off in the end. Pets are no pets. My dog and my cat love my garden. Kids love my garden. I believe you should solely try to include children in gardening if you can. Those grandbabies, our kids, they love it. Uh, wildlife, like I mentioned with the deer, but there's also birds. If you go nature friendly, there's your caterpillars, your butterflies, you might even have some ants. All of those things play a part in choosing the best location. But most important, in addition to the sun, the shade, rain and wind, is access to the kitchen. Yes, the kitchen. I say that because you want to be able to use the items in your garden. And if it's not accessible or easy for you to get to, you won't go to it. Our trash cans for our house, they sit so far up on our property that I have to, and my husband and I, we have to put our trash on our car sometimes and bring it to our trash cans. So imagine how often we actually take our trash out and how easy it is for us to just put our trash in the trash can nearest our door or nearest our, the outside space so that we can keep our house smelling clean, of course, but just to be able to access and put that trash out there. That's how you want your garden to be. You want it to be a place where you can access easily and be able to eat from it on a regular and day-to-day -day basis. All right, so now we're gonna move on. I'm gonna show you some pictures of what it looks like to choose between the sun and the shade. Here you can see a home that has a giant tree in their space. This is where I say, try to limit what you grow there. It looks like a really nice space to start a garden, but if you can see that sunnier space off closer to the house, that's what I would, that's the spot that I would suggest you grow in. We can't move the sun. With the exception of grow lights, we can do a bit more, but if you do decide to plant directly in that sun, you can always use shade covers to protect your plants from that heat of sun during those spring and summer months. All right, take a look at this picture with the shovel. This says after rain and wind. Too much wind can damage trellising plants like your tomatoes, your eggplants, anything that grows pretty tall. And heavy rains can sometimes damage your beds and make it a pain to tend to. So if you constantly have to walk through slushy mud just to get to your garden, or the water is so bad and the area just floods completely, you're losing seeds, you're losing crops. Those are some of the things that you wanna pay attention to when you're choosing your garden space. Also, I had a question about balcony and backyard and patio gardens. I put my little quote there. It's one of my slogans for my business. It says, no matter what you have, 
something can grow there. So in these two pictures, you can see that they took and actually put even more effort into the space to make it look really nice um, when they go out there to do their gardening. They use some vertical space, if you notice in the picture to the left, and the picture on the right used a lot of pots and some of their lower spaces. So either one is fine. Of course, you follow the regulations for things like this with your property. But they went so far as to add tile on the floors. They have the fake grass. They added rocks. So it really creates this garden oasis for growing things back there. So if this is something that this is one of your questions, you had some design issues you wanted, you know, with this here, this would be the perfect uh, picture to go ahead and screenshot. So I'll give you a second if you want to screenshot this and it'll give you some ideas for your space. All right, awesome, we're gonna keep going. All right, let me know guys, if y'all are good, go ahead, put a check mark in. Sure, Natalie, you can, you sure can do that for me. I'd appreciate that, thank you. All right, so here is a picture of my garden and how it started out. I wish I had a, a chance to put the after because it looks dramatically different. You'll get like a glimpse of it in a future post, but this is how my garden, now that I'm in a house with a backyard, this is what it started out as. I got very, very excited. I went to Home Depot, bought wood. I bought those little Lego kind of blocks and I did four by four beds and I put them all around in one big square. Now, if you notice with these beds, this is me experimenting for the first time in my backyard growing something. It would be hard to access the middle of the bed. So I couldn't grow anything to the center, which means I'm wasting space. And when it was time to cover them or protect them or anything, I was actually walking like a tightrope on the wood that was in, that was in my bed. So I would have to walk across to do any weeding. I'd have to walk across to pick anything out of my garden that grew towards the center. And it really just didn't make for an advantageous space for growing. Thankfully, I was just so inspired and so motivated to grow that I went ahead and worked with this anyway for almost a year and a half. Finally, I decided I've had enough. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that my beds are accessible that I can get to all of our fruits and vegetables and make sure everything grows successfully. So I updated and changed my beds. The picture on the right is another way to grow in ground, creating a space. She actually has fencing going around her garden. So it makes a huge difference. I think you can see from the picture that they live in like a woodsy area. So those of you who have those deer and elements like that, that might try to eat your crops, that could be something that you do, creating that fencing around your space. All right, let's keep going. Here are two other ideas for planting in the spaces that you have. Uh, on the picture on the left is kind of blurry. I didn't realize the pixelation, but there's a bed going across the wall behind the chair. There's another, and there's two raised beds in the front. And then they went ahead and created a little barrier with some rocks and mulching in between. I'm so sorry that it's so blurry, I did not realize. All right, and the bed on the right, they did something really, really simple. In my opinion, this is for that new gardener or the person wanting to garden with their kids. You create this space that is perfect for growing smaller crops and crops that, that have low root or I guess not as deep root systems. So they're really shallow. So things like your lettuce, you can see in the picture, they planted some bunching onions, spinach. Uh, let's see, looks like a little parsley's off to the back. So all of these things are shallow root and they'll be able to grow in a space like this that doesn't have a lot of soil in the ground. It's kind of spread across the top. So if that's something that you wanna do, that'd be a little project to, to tackle. All right, people are still entering, I'm excited. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us, welcome. All right, we're on to part two. I'm moving, I'm moving. All right, give me a thumbs up if you're still with me. If this information is valuable to you, go ahead, put a smiley face in the chat box. I appreciate it. Uh, volume, if you're using your keypad, 
on your key look on your keyboard you should be able to press the volume button on there if not you might have something on your headphones you it, it varies on everybody's system all right i hope that helped wherever you all right okay i hope that answered whoever's uh question welcome terry welcome to the group all right so this is talking about fencing kids in the garden pets in the garden and wildlife so if you have kids, if you have pets, or if you're experiencing deer, go ahead and put a sad face in the chat box. If you have pets, kids, deer, ooh, 11 year old son and two puppies. Oh, cute Tika. All right, anybody else? <laughs> yes, we have those kids. Our kids may want to garden with us. Ooh, three dogs, three dogs. Bless you, Patty. I have one dog, one cat. Oh, Julie, you have deer, cats, <laughs> nine rats, four guinea pigs, three cats. Gosh, yes, the sweaty, yes, the sweat laugh is yes. <laughs> All right, keep them coming. I want to see what you guys have going on. But, but you can see my daughter. That's my daughter in the picture. She's two years old now, but in that picture, she was actually 16 months. This was the perfect opportunity for me to introduce vegetables to her um once a child gets to a certain age they kind of just don't want any vegetables anymore they turn their head away they toss the plate they flip it they throw it whatever they do not like anything green anything yellow anything that tastes weird and not sweet to them but I was lucky enough to have her join me in the garden um I was a stay-at-home mom for a bit and I still technically am um, but she stayed home with me for the first year and a half of her life, and she was my gardening partner. This is what helped her enjoy vegetables today, and she gets compliments all the time because she'll eat her broccoli or green peas or corn when I pack it in her lunchbox, and we have some peas growing. She eats them straight off the vine here, too, so having children or pets in your space, it definitely is a way to get them to continue to eat those veggies they're watching something grow they feel equally as inspired as you and it just makes them want it so much more as for fencing those with the deer if you have pets and you don't want them in your beds there are so many fence options available to you when you go on pinterest and you look at different youtube videos and you just google and you'll find different ideas um it just really depends on how intense the wildlife is when you create your space. If deers are like, literally you wake up in the morning, you see one every day, I would want a nice tall, heavy duty, secure wooden or uh, metal fence around to support and protect my garden. If it's just some smaller animals, your dogs, your cats, you just don't want them in that space and you can get away with a slightly lower fence and it'll be okay. Um, so that's pretty much what I have to say about fencing kids and pets. We're going to go ahead and take a look at a few things. All right, so here it is. It says, what should I grow in? So this is a bit tricky because depending on your space, you have the decision to grow in pots and grow bags. You can grow in ground, in raised beds. You can use whatever you have. I say that because you might only have a red solo cup. You might only have a toilet paper tube. You may have tons and tons of milk cartons and milk jugs. All of those things are able to be grown into. It also depends on if you want the space to be a temporary space, say you're living in an apartment, you know you're going to move, you don't want to put anything in ground. You don't want anything too heavy. That will let you know what to choose from. Um, right here, I have one of the little uh, cardboard kind of cardstocky kind of pots. And in this pot, it can actually transfer directly into the garden, growing into something like this. That means your root systems aren't disturbed or anything like that if you decide to plant in one of these or some type of uh, perishable container. So you're looking at your car, anything cardboard or, or paper for the most part, you can grow in. Um, family and pets, that determines what you should grow in. If you want your kids to be able to access your beds, you might want something lower. 
if you have any type of challenge um, walking or your arms, you may have arthritis or things like that. You might want a, a bed that is elevated. Uh, In-ground beds are wonderful. If the soil content is nice or if you are fortunate enough to be able to make your soil content and protect it um, in those beds, you would be able to have an advantage of growing and allowing your plants to grow deeper into the soil. So that's one of the advantages of in-ground growing. I see a lot of writing. Let's see, I have to figure out. <laughs> all right, let's see. For all of my uh, drawings here happening on the screen. <laughs> I think it's funny. All right, and let's see, reach. As I mentioned before, trying to reach those garden beds and trying to make sure that they're accessible to you and your needs specifically. Um, you can prepare, you can decide, I need a grow bag, I wanna use a raised bed, which you'll see in a picture down the line. Also, it's based on plants. So if you have a tomato plant, they, they would prefer a, a system where they can grow a bit deeper. So that would be a deeper grow bag or being able to put them in a raised bed but also I suggest not putting anything at the bottom of the raised bed and letting them grow into the ground or growing in the ground in the first place, or you can grow them in a pot, but make sure that they have enough for their root systems to spread. So that's really based on the plant. And at the bottom, I, want, I put two stars next to this because I forgot to mention it before, but remember your water source. It should be close or accessible to your garden space. So make sure and remember that the access to water is super, super important. All right, so here in this picture, you see all the different options for growing in. There's hanging pots. There's that dog in the garden again. And there's those kids in the garden again. There's some vertical options. You have the trellis is there, you have a raised bed, and you have a pot you normally see on someone's porch or something of that nature. So those are just some options and ideas. All right, so here we go. This is the fun part. Get your pencil, get your pen, get your paper. We're going to just quickly for about two to three minutes, just sketch our ideas. So right now I want you to quickly just close your eyes wherever you are. Dream up your garden space, what you want it to look like wherever you are. Think about what you want in your space. And when I say what you want, do you want those raised beds? Do you want elevated raised beds? Would you like a grow bag? Would you like to use pots? Um, someone is not muted. If that is you, can you please um, mute yourself? Because we can all hear. Thank you so much. Um, think about what you want in your space. And then next, you want to take some time and figure out what elements you want, your fruits, your vegetables. Do you see your kids in the space with you? Do you see your animals in the space with you? Do you see the deer attacking and the birds trying to eat your blackberries off your trees? If you envision all of that, if you got that, open your eyes, go ahead, get your pencil and pen and sketch your space. We're gonna do it together. So here in this picture, I have my layout that I am using for my garden. So like I mentioned before, I expanded. I'm gonna see if I can find and make sure everyone is muted because I hear some feedback and I don't know if anyone else can, but I can. And if it is you, please check and see. Thank you. Give me a second, guys. All right, I think I found it. Okay. All right, I hope that worked. If not, we're gonna keep going. All right, so here we go. So in this picture, you can see my beds. I told you guys before that I changed my beds. I made a decision that I could not access my garden as well as I wanted to, and I added on to my garden. So all three of these and this long, actually this long rectangle one, so all the ones at the bottom of the page, those three beds were the four beds that I had together. I made a long rectangle bed in the middle as an experiment following 
this book that I, I read. You'll see that at the end as a resource. Um, on the top, those two smaller circles, those are two grow bags that were meant to grow potatoes. They did not work for my potatoes. They did not work for my onions. They did not work for my garlic. So this year I'm going to use them for tomatoes. So they are deep enough for tomatoes and that will be what goes there. And we use tomatoes quite a bit. So those grow bags will hold tomatoes, but I'm also gonna put them in my beds at some point. Um, also the three beds that you see at the top, those hold quite a bit. The one in the center, the circle, is actually a large grow bag and I actually love it. I thought I wouldn't like it as much. I wasn't sure, but I used what I had in my garden to do these things. So like I said before, if someone gave you a wooden raised bed, use it. There are a lot of things out here that try to, <laughs> yes, I, I lucked out choosing this property, Dan. Um, with the realtor. I just fell in love with it. You, you would be amazed at how beautiful it is here. But um, with that, that raised beds, all the raised beds that I have, with the exception of a few, I was just blessed with items. A lot of my clients were, were like, here, I have this extra bed. I'm not using it. I have this in a box. You can have it. And at one point I was so bent on having my garden look a certain way that it prevented me from using what I had on hand. And I just tell you, when you're first starting out, don't, don't worry about that. The goal is to grow food for you and your family to enjoy. And you want to keep that in mind. That's like number one, the aesthetics of the space, the appeal of the space. Yes, it makes it more inviting and more exciting, but you can change that and build that over time. But first things first is to start the experience, start experimenting and just continue to grow. All right. So here, now that everyone's drawn their bed, how many of you feel pretty confident that you are able to bring that to life? Put like a smiley face, maybe one to three if you are like, probably not. This is just a dream. You know, if it was something you know you can do, <laughs> you dream big, huh, Cynthia? That's not a problem. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Hi from Ohio. I'm gonna go ahead and answer a few questions to everybody answers. Um, what do you do with the dirt in your pots at the end of the year? Do you throw it away? It depends on how it looks. And I don't throw it away for a few reasons. One, I have a giant hole where a tree was planted before we moved here and they chopped that tree. I just throw my, my dirt that looks too old in there. But some dirt can be revitalized. I won't be able to talk about that much in this class, but in future classes, you'll see um, that will be discussed in great detail, but you can revitalize soil in a number of ways and reuse it again for the following year. There's some a process to it a bit, Melinda, but it's possible. And I wash my pots, I just sterilize them. Um, I just use hot water and a bit of Dawn dish soap and clean them off. I'm getting ready to actually do that now in another week or two. Uh, bleach just a little bit, just a drop and wash my pots off with hose pipe and clean them. Yep. All right. We got some new people joining the room. Welcome. Welcome. All right. How deep of a grow bag would you recommend for tomatoes? Also, would I need a tomato cage with a bag? Uh, yes, you would need a tomato cage. Um, it depends on, of course, what's available in your area. The ones that you will see that they'll market to you to death and they come in a lot of different colors. Those don't hold as well. You if everything goes well with growing your tomato, the way a tomato plant will begin to grow, it won't have enough stability. Those tomatoes won't have much to hang on once if you just use three tiers. The goal is to find an apparatus that has more spaces for the leaves to stick into where those tomatoes can hang on, if that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, we can talk later on at the end and I can actually give you a little more detail on that. Um, as far as depth, probably about maybe 18 inches deep. My grow bags are about this wide. So you're looking at a ruler and a little more. So maybe about 18 inches. Uh, somebody just unmuted. If you can check and make sure that isn't you, I'd appreciate it. 
All right, let's see. I'm answer a few more questions. How do you stop pets from using your planter's beds as a litter box? The cats and dogs seem just like children, just a concern for me. I don't know about your pet, but for me, it was just a quick stop. Don't do that. Other than that, every now and then I might find something in there, a nice little surprise. And I just clean it out and I'm shooing my cat away. Or I look at him through the window and he knows not to do it. My cat is actually like 16 years old, guys. I've had him for half of my lifetime. And uh, so he knows me and I know him and he knows my look. So he knows what I mean. But if it is still a big deal, um, the goal is to just put something around it, fencing, a different post or give him his space. I actually planted some, um, what is it called? And it's, it's out right now at, at a lot of the big box stores starting in our area because it's warmer and I'm sure it'll progress, but it's the plants. I can't think of it at this point, guys, but they, they love the smell of it. And I made his little space just for him. All right. So I'm going to continue due to time. And thank you guys for sharing your experiences. Yes, catnip. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Lucy. Yes. All right, guys. So here is some quick little facts. Um, it says 70% of gardeners grow vegetables while 30% grow other types of food. So you're looking at your herbs and uh, some people like to start medicine or medical herb or medicinal herb gardens. You have flowers and people are solely focused on flowers because they want to do the cut and they grow again, they're able to sell them at farmer's markets and things like that. So you have those different options in the garden. All right, so this is how you determine if you should plant seeds or purchase seedlings. It's two things for me that I've noticed in my years of gardening that I see happen with my clients and stuff like that. It depends on the time and your level of resiliency. Time means that when you visit your big box store, such as Walmart, Home Depot, wherever you buy your plants from, you can see the time frame that they start to put their plants out. Right now, it's still cold where I live, but they're putting out those hardy-ish green leafy vegetables. So I was able to go pick up like a pack of romaine. There's spinach out there. Um, there were some cabbage plants that were coming out. So all of these things are things that you can still pick up take care of, maintain in this cold season, and they'll keep growing into about the beginning of spring. And then it's time to kind of revamp and you'll see some new things happening. So it depends on the time, the season. Um, also, how much time do you want to dedicate to your seeds and watching it grow? Like I said before, sometimes seeds do not germinate. They do not grow. Um, sometimes you overwater them, underwater them and kill them. Or just a lot of things can happen in that time, which brings me to resiliency. This gentleman in the picture, I use that face because that's the face that a lot of my clients have tended to get when nothing happened in their raised beds that first few months of planting something. And I had to go back, motivate them, encourage them and tell them, no, let's just try this and let's do this differently because you know, we need to build that, that level of resiliency with a garden. So if you know that you're a person that kicks the bucket when something goes wrong, then I suggest buying seedlings. That means purchasing your starts from a garden center and planting them. If you know you want to kind of, you have that time, you have that patience, you have that resiliency. If something doesn't work, you're willing to try it again, then go ahead and start as seeds. Um, it also depends on where you live. If you want to do seeds or purchase seedlings. So all of that plays a part in what you select. So here, hi Tia, welcome to the group. Um, here I have a few pictures of plants that I find are pretty easy to grow with the exception of carrots and they can be tricky. And tip for you guys to write down, root vegetables that they try to sell you at the store. You'll see them occasionally do carrots. Peas aren't considered a root vegetable, but you'll see pea starts, you'll see bean starts sometimes, carrots, radishes, all of those things. Let me break this up. Carrots and radishes are your root vegetables. If they try to sell those to you in a big box store, do not buy them. Root vegetables have a tendency to have a little trouble being moved and transplanted from pot to pot to ground to pot. They don't like to move they'll end up curving or they just won't grow at all. Do your best to figure out a method to grow these root vegetables by seed at your home, wherever you are. 
peas and beans. They'll try to sell you those things. The peas and beans have the quickest germination rate and they will grow so tall and you'll have peas and beans to eat in about three or four weeks time after planting a seed. So do not grow these. Just take the time to enjoy that, that little process of watching them grow from seed to plant to going into your mouth. All right. Next are lettuce and tomatoes. They grow very, very easy, very, very quickly. You get that easy uh, validation of being a gardener when you grow lettuce and when you have uh, tomatoes growing, if you take care of these things properly. That is the biggest thing here, making sure to take care of everything that you plant properly and you'll reap that great harvest. All right. So what do, what are some of the things that you can grow in your garden? I have herbs here, uh, vegetables and fruits and flowers. I'm not going to read all of this, but the herbs, a lot of people grow them for the medicinal purposes. We all know with COVID-19 and the variations that are coming this year and throughout, a lot of people have folks started to focus on herbs and how to use herbs in their gardens and how to use herbs with their families to protect them from different illnesses. So herbs are very easy to grow. Uh, they need soil that drains well, some watering. You can use a little fertilizer, a little compost, but herbs have a tendency to take care of themselves. Um, fruit, vegetables and fruits, if you grow your own, you know where it comes from. You've done the work, so you're excited about eating it, and I'm sure your families will be too. Um, and flowers. Flowers can be used in the garden to companion plant by deterring other pests. They can attract beneficial insects and pollinators such as your bees. So it's really important to have a space or in your garden provide spaces for those flowers. That will really help with the process when your tomatoes start to put on flowers and you need a bee in your garden. And bees were very, very picky, I'll say, last year because I didn't have as many bees, but I had friends and neighbors and other clients that were like, the bees are all over my garden. So I knew I was doing something wrong in mine. So this year I'm adding three times as many flowers as I've had in the past in my garden. So flowers are a big, big thing. Yes, lavender is good for mosquitoes. And I also heard that the actual plant that they put out um, that they tell us in the big box stores repels mosquitoes. That plant, actually the oils on the inside of it are what repels. So what we buy, there's nothing really happening. It gives off a good aroma, a good scent. But there, that's all it is. It's not really repelling anything. It's actual oil. So you literally have to crush the leaf and crush the stem to be able to release those oils that would do the repelling of the mosquitoes. So thank you for sharing that, Dan. All right, we're going to move into soil selection um, and maintenance. So I'm going to go really, really quick in this part because I still want to leave room for those questions at the very, very end. At the bottom, you can see I put two stars. It says, do your research with all of this. If you go organic, if you choose blended soils, and when I say blended soils, there's a lot of garden centers that mix soils and mix it with compost and all these different fertilizers, and they sell it to you in bulk. Um, so those are your blended soils. Purchase soils from your local garden centers, like the miracle Grow, any of the organic mixes. Some people do like a topsoil sand with worm castings. So whatever you decide, even compost. I have a client, her garden beds were filled with nothing but compost. And she got the compost from another gardener who pretty much set her up for success. And you could drop a baby in her compost, in her garden beds. And you're going to multiply and have like a thousand babies. Like that's how fertile and nutritious her compost in those beds were. I was just blown away. I was like, I have to do something with my soil. And I've actually been experimenting with soil and soil mixes for the past like three years since I've started doing my garden. So the best thing for you to do is do your research. There's no right or wrong. And you'll hear a lot of things about soils. Um, just do your research. I can go on and on. Uh, next is maintenance and protection tips. Watering, pest control, disease control, leaf watch, fertilizers, compost, wildlife, nature's events. All of those things are what you want to look out for in your garden. You want to make sure for number one, you might want a screenshot or right next to it if you're totally brand new. But number one, when you water, be mindful not to underwater or overwater. Either way, you can kill your plants. 
pay attention to them. The way you pay attention to it, I'm going to skip down a little bit, is by watching your leaves. Leaves turn yellow when they're lacking nitrogen, which means there's usually too much water. Uh, sometimes they turn other colors when they're not getting adequate sunlight. Sometimes they go, come, go missing because you have pests in your garden. So you want to really pay attention to those things. Um, disease control. Tomato plants, you'll hear a lot about watering them from the root system and trying not to splash water on the stem of the plant because that can promote diseases. Uh, fertilizers, compost, those are ways to have proper maintenance of your garden to help continue that nutritional value, help them to continue to grow. Protecting your garden from wildlife means putting those fences up, putting proper um, netting to control those things and nature's events. Like I said, my garden is in the center of the L shape of my home. So if a hurricane wind comes, it usually doesn't affect my garden space. All right, y'all with me so far? We're doing good, we're still holding. All right, I hope this information is valuable to you. All right, really quick. I think we made it to the end, I think so. All right, and we got seven minutes. I'm gonna go a little over for questions and answers, but here are some resources. These are a couple of books to help your garden grow. These are my favorites, actually. So I have um, Kitchen Garden Revival by Nicole John C. Burke. You might have come across her stuff on Facebook or Instagram, other social media platforms, but her goal is to create a stylish, small scale, low maintenance, edible kitchen garden, actually. She focuses more on things you see in the kitchen. Um, Tammy Wiley, he has a raised bed garden for beginners. Uh, everything you need to know to start and sustain a thriving garden. And last is Veg in One Bed. This is another one of my favorite books. He literally has pictures for everything. I suggest screenshotting this, taking a picture of this page here because that book, if you're a new gardener, you're going to want this. He has pictures of the beds. He tells you what to grow month by month and walks you through how to pot them, when to plant them, when to start a seed. Like it, he lays it out. I really, really love his book. All right, next resource is me. I didn't say the name of my company at the beginning, but this is my company called the Backyard Garden Experience. We do consultations, maintenance, garden installations. And the goal here is to help you grow where you are planted. So if you have any questions, my email address is right there at the bottom. And you can reach out to me about anything. And actually, because you attended, you get a free gift at the very, very end that relates to this. Uh, also, here are some resources. This is me at Instagram, The Binge LLC. This is my Facebook, TBYGE. Some of you might've already found me thanks to this workshop. Um, at the bottom is our Facebook group. And at the top is my website, www.thebinge.com, which a lot of you probably access already. All right, and then here it is, that free gift. So to thank you for your attendance and participation, you get a free 10 minute consultation with me. This consultation, if you see the link on the screen, you can screenshot it, but I'm also going to put these links in the chat box. But please schedule your session as soon as possible. The spots fill up fast. Um, but the 10 minute consultation is composed of you selecting a time and date that works for you based on what I have available. And we will talk by phone or via Zoom or FaceTime or whatever the method might be. And you can ask me any questions, preferably two is probably what we can squeeze in in 10 minutes, but I answer whatever questions you might have about your garden and what you want to grow. All right, so here is Q and A time. I hope that helped everyone. I'm gonna go ahead really quick and stop sharing my screen. All right, make sure that was my last one. Yes, it was. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm going in the chat box. I'm going to give you guys the links to all of the information. So this is a resource list that you can use if I miss something today and you're like, I still want to know more, just click one of these links and that will help you out tremendously. All right, let's see, chat box.
And thank you all for being so patient and supportive. I highly appreciate it. There is more to come. All right, so there it is. Oh, look at the hearts. I love it. I love it. All right, so in the chat box, you have the link to our Facebook group. You have the link to sign up for the consultation. So you're more than welcome to do that. And let's see, myself. All right, there we go. I can see me nice and big. Thank you, thank you, Cindy. I appreciate it. All right, so really quick, let's see. I'm gonna scroll through. If I'm not looking at you guys, I apologize. I'm not ignoring you. If you need to leave, because we actually have three minutes to spare, but if you need to leave, I appreciate it. You coming and I hope to see you again. I wanna say that I do have some uh, other classes coming up. I'm actually putting together a five Saturday series um, and you'll be able to get each Saturday, we're going to step into a new section of gardening. So we're going to do everything from planting our seeds to learning about vertical gardening, how to choose our seeds and seedlings all the way into March when we get to plant them in the ground when everything first starts with the nice, beautiful sunshine and beautiful hot weather, which I can't wait for. So if you do need to leave at this time, go ahead. If you do have those questions, go ahead and start typing them in the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and look at some of the questions that we're filtering in in our chat box. Let's see. One of the questions I have right now says my tomato plants, my tomato plants get leggy even when I pull off the suckers. Crazy and long and leggy. Any tips? That's just a part of, of maintaining your tomato plants. And the goal is when they first start to grow, if they're small seedlings, that's when you want to train it on what you want it to do and how you want it to grow. But that's, that's pretty much just a part of the maintenance of a, of a tomato plant. They'll grow crazy. If it is something that you find to be very, very uh, irritating, you know, and it bothers you a whole lot, you might want to get more of a determinate tomato versus an indeterminate. Indeterminate will go wild. They'll grow as tall as, as they as they feel like growing as well as you take care of them, but it determine it kind of stays small ish and it already knows how many tomatoes it wants to grow and it won't get any bigger, any smaller or anything. So it may be trying to determine it plant this season and see if you like that better. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Tika says, would herbs grow better in pots versus in the ground or a raised bed? Herbs are not picky. They're not picky. I have rosemary in a pot. I have parsley in, I don't know if y'all remember, but I think it was 2020, maybe 2019 and the Dollar Tree caught onto the trend of those stacking pots. I grow parsley. Uh, I grow my thyme, a little chamomile, all those things I kind of get away with growing in those stacked pots. And then I have some in my beds. Uh, let's see. So I hope that helps answer your question. So yeah, you can put, you can put herbs anywhere. My sage is in my garden bed. It's happy there. So not picky at all. Some sort of tiny bugs eat up my kale and my raised beds faster than I can harvest. How can I prevent this? There's something called neem oil and it depends. Neem oil pretty much covers a large majority of plant of bugs or pests that like to eat on our plants. So you can spray the leaves with neem oil. Just make sure when you do get ready to harvest that you just wash them really, really well before eating. Um, other than that, it depends on the pest. I'm not really sure what you're experiencing, but you can do a dawn, like a one part dawn to like four parts water mixture and spray that on your plants as well. That does a great job of keeping things back. And other than that, I suggest eat the kale. Eat the kale or grow so much kale that some of the pests can have some kale and so can you. Uh, let's see, can herbs in pots stay out in the winter? It did, my winters in zone eight and below, we experience about 20, 20 degrees. That's how cold it gets here. If you do need to keep your herbs outside, just cover them. I have not had any issues with my herbs being uncovered at this time with the exception of my sage because it's in my raised beds, but everything that I have outside of my raised beds has done well. Um, I do have one, I can't think of the name of it at this time. I have to share it in our group later and put a picture, but I do have one that, that didn't do well in the, without being covered. Um, 
if you do need to leave, go ahead. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you, Cindy. Um, and like June, like I said, I'm in zone eight. Uh, let's see, what can I use to fight squash bugs and cucumber beetles? Yes, this is a big one. Um, I've come across somebody saying to wrap the root system of your squash plants, and this includes pumpkins, regular squash, anything with like a nice circular cylinder root system, wrap it in aluminum foil, plant it in the ground, and it'll deter the pest, the, what is it where I'm looking for? That vine beetle, you can't, you can't get in there. You can't eat it because you can't penetrate the foil, if that makes sense. Uh, other than that, you can kind of build like a little apparatus around the outside. But so far, I have not tried the foil method with these, but, you know, work in progress, I suppose. Uh, let's see. Do you think it is a good time to start seedlings indoors? Yes, February is the perfect time to start seedlings indoors, depending on what zone you're in. March is usually when it gets warm in my zone, zone 8B, um, and then it kind of progressively moves up our United States, and everybody starts to get warm at that point, so March, April is when you can start putting these things in your bed. Hi, Cindy, thank you, thank you, Crystal, is when you can start putting your seedlings in the bed, so yes, if you can start something indoors with a good grow light, a good seed starting mixture, um, this is the perfect time to do so. Uh, let, I feel like I'm missing some questions here. Yeah. Uh, the best way to grow basil, uh, I suggest starting now. Herbs have a tendency to take a while to grow and they don't have the best success rate if you try to grow them yourselves as they would being grown with the garden center. Um, if you do experience any trouble having germination issues or anything of that nature, just go buy one. Basil is pretty organic friendly. You can always kind of wash the soil off if you are into being organic, um, and that would pretty much help with the basil. Uh, Tika, you said I have raised a raised bed garden and want to know what should I do to the soil to get it ready for this year? Well, I need to till it. You do not have to till your raised beds. Um, when you have raised beds or any pot, you really don't wanna disturb what's already happening in the soil. So anything underneath that top layer, don't disturb it because the nutrients are slowly just packing themselves in, packing themselves in. So when you plant that new tomato, the root systems are like, oh, I love this. And they just start to spread because you've allowed your nutrients to just continue to move. The best thing to do is clear off the mulch if you have any or any whatever's protecting your beds right now. Um, put a fresh layer of compost. You can get the compost from your big box store. You can get it from a garden center. You can make your own, which is a class I have coming up. Um, and just put a layer of compost across the top. If you see any weeds, of course, pick those out. And then that's pretty much how you start fresh. You fertilize your beds with any type of dry fertilizer or use any liquid fertilizer. And that is all you need to do to your beds to prep them for the new season. So do not till. It will disrupt the soil life so much. That's actually what I'm facing this season because I moved my beds around. I also had to move some soil around. So I was like, oh, the sacrifices you make for design. But that is one of the things that happened. Thank you, Felton. I'm glad you had a real good time. Uh, can you help me grow real roses, long stem type? I, I don't know if this will help you, Rochelle, but I purchased my roses from the store. None of my roses were like grown from any type of seed or they'll be the ones in like the gray containers where you have the root system, but no leaves. I have two rose plants that are actually in pots. They started as little babies in this little gray container, no leaves. And they are taller than me. They're taller than my husband. They got, they have to be about seven feet tall right now. I, since they were my experiment, I never trimmed them back like you were supposed, like you're supposed to. I never trimmed them back. I wanted to just, to just see what they would do. So for the past four years, they've just been taller and taller and taller and putting off several flowers at a time. And they just continue to come throughout the season. Even with the winter, our winter has been super sporadic with hot temperatures and cold. They they're still putting off roses. So Rochelle, if that helps any, um, I hope it does. As far as like long stem roses, which I think you may be talking about like cut and come again, kind of roses, those you would have to, I'd have to get some more information on, but I'm 
the ones that I have growing now, they do have long stems and I just, I just keep them in a pot. I keep them in a pot. I keep them watered, not a water them too much. And I just watch them, engage them like I would my children or my pets to see what they need. And every occasionally I'll put um, the rose fertilizer on it when they need it and cut them so they'll know to continue to grow. Let's see, Lucy, how to tell the difference between needing nitrogen versus iron. Usually I look at the leaves of the plant. If there's any yellowing, if you start to see um, brown spots, if you do a soil test, that's also very, very helpful um, to finding out what your plants might need. Soil tests will give you that specific information on your garden. So you can get those soil tests through your agricultural center in your area, which is you know usually a local university. You can call, talk to like a garden center, or you can go to Lowe's and get the little kit. Just pay attention because sometimes the there's little different color pellets that are for nitrogen, phosphorus, and when you use them, sometimes they're dried out. So you want to pay attention to the one you use or the one you purchase. Uh, Tika, do you think using rainwater is good for gardens? We have rain barrels. Rainwater is fine. Any water source, I mean, you want to pay attention to if you have like hard water or, you know, something's in your water. If there's a contaminant or something like that. You want to pay attention to that. Um that will affect your plants if it's coming out of the hose. But rainwater and a rain barrel is fine. Uh, people swear by it. Some of them like that's the best thing to use. But like I said at the very, very beginning, just use what you have. This is all a process. If you notice this is working for you, it probably won't work for somebody else, but it's working for you. Use it. Uh, thank you, Dan, for participating. We're glad to have you. All right. Any more questions? I have a compost bin. How often should I dump the compost in the garden when it starts to look like soil? When your compost is brown, it's it's a nice crumbly texture. A lot of the elements are broken down. Whatever you put in there, you can't recognize, put it in your beds. My mustard greens actually benefited greatly from compost that my daughter and I made. She's two now. We started when she was one. It took about a year of us constantly tossing the bin and uh, she enjoyed it. Do I compost over winter? No, I compost just before winter. So just before like that first frost, I'll start to do everything to protect my beds. I put some fertilizer down. I planted some potatoes that were uh, starting to do some chitting and uh, all of those things. I kind of just prepared my space for the winter. That way, the cold temperatures, when the sun comes out, even after fresh snow, there's water, there's dew. So all that's working to your advantage in the winter. Plants are less likely to grow as quickly, so they don't need as many nutrients. If you fertilize them during the winter, you're going to kind of trick your crops into thinking that it's time to grow. You don't want to do that. So put a little small thing of fertilizer, a little bit of compost, and just let it lay until it starts to warm up again and become the time to grow. Uh, Sheila, I have not had a garden for two years. I plan to till it after picking out leaves. Uh, does this sound like a good path to take? If you if you have an in-ground garden, yes, you can till. I wouldn't till. I would till and I actually, I would check the soil first. See what's there. Just because you haven't planted a garden for two years, that top layer may be dry or whatever due to the elements. But once you dig underneath, it may be perfectly fine. Um, there's also the option to not even till. If you are growing in ground, you can lay some cardboard down and just start your garden on top of that cardboard. And eventually the cardboard will disintegrate, act as a nutrient and phosphorus medium for your plants. And you can go ahead and put soil and compost mix on top of that and just plant on top of that cardboard and treat it as if it's like a, a raised bed, even though it's in ground. If you are doing raised beds, like I told another attendee before, um, clean the raised beds out, put that layer of compost and just don't, touch the underlying soil unless you notice that something really funny is going on with your soil. Other than that, just leave it alone. Uh, Sandy, when did I need to pick the dead heads of my hydrangea bush or do I? It depends. Um, I had a, a client that had a hydrangea. Um, when they turned brown, of course, I clipped them. Um, her garden soil's life wasn't as grand, so they didn't do as well. But I would go ahead and snip them just like I would roses. If they're starting to look brown, snip them off. Um, 
the season for them to bloom again is near. So I will go ahead and usually people clip them back just a little so that they can get a nicer bloom during the season for them to grow. So like I said, once you see them turning brown, go ahead and snip them off and that'll give them a chance to push the nutrients into the parts that want to grow or that are growing. All right, anybody else see the questions coming slowly? Make sure I didn't miss anything. All right, I think I answered all our questions. All right, looks good. Anybody else? Last but not least, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Sika. All righty, everyone. Well, if you have any further questions, remember to take advantage of that consultation opportunity. Yes, Esteline, I'm going to do my best to remember to share uh, the recording. I might do so in one of our groups, and I definitely will do so on my page. So I'm going to go ahead and share in the chat one more time all of the resources so that if you still have more questions. Thank you, Cheryl, for the love. I appreciate it. So if you do have any other questions that I didn't get to answer, you can take advantage of that free gift, free 10 minute consultation. Use the link at Kalindly. I already had somebody sign up. I'm super excited. So they're going to fill up. So choose a time, a date that works for you and we can chat about your space. Thank you, Julie. All right, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much. All righty, guys. Well, that is it for me. Make sure to go visit our website, www.thebench.com, because there are quite a few more classes coming up for the spring. One of them is my fave. Um, it's the five Saturday sessions. So I'll be walking you through growing all the way through. Hi, Esteline. I love seeing people's faces and I love your background. Uh, I'm going to have five Saturday sessions. There at 6 p.m. around this time, um, one hour long, and it'll be going through each cycle or part. Hi Rochelle, I've seen your face as well of gardening. So if you really want to do something like that, you want somebody to kind of walk with you as you grow this season, that's the session you might want to go to. I also have one for kids. So like I said, just click on that classroom and workshops link on my website and you'll be able to see everything that's coming up because I'm I'm amped up for spring. All right, Natalie, bye. Annette, thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, that is it. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. I hope it was informative and I hope to see you guys in our next session. Love you guys. Y'all have a good, good night. Thank you so much. And let's see if I can move all this stuff so I can close us out of here. <laughs> Alrighty guys, y'all have a good night. Bye-bye.